we have a wonderful panel today that looks at the use of technology, um, AI, and data in the effort to uh, deal with con uh, contact tracing, COVID testing, and a whole slew of other um, public health issues that have popped up in the last eight, nine months. So um, without further ado, um, I'll have each of you introduce yourself briefly, uh, just a few words, if you would. Um, that'd be really great. Um, why don't we start with uh, you, Jan? Please. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Yan Liu. I'm a social professor in the computer science department at uh, Universal Southern California. I'm also the director of uh, Machine Learning Center here at USC. My research work is on machine learning and AI in general uh, for the social good applications. And specifically in the past few months, we've been working on how we can use AI to address the COVID-19. Thank you, Yan. Um, Eliezer, why don't you uh, go next? Hi, um, I'm Eliezer Eskin. I work at UCLA. I'm the chair of a new department called Computational Medicine. Our goal in the department is to leverage technology, specifically genomics, AI, and cryptography to try to transform patient care at UCLA and spread that to other health systems. Uh, Joe. And you guys want, oh, Joe. Sorry, Joe, we have two Joes. Joe Wilson, yes, yeah, sorry, there's double Joe. Um, I think, um, Joe Bakhti, I think your name popped up as Farrah Martin, is that? Yeah, I couldn't make it work on my computer. I couldn't get to backstage, so I used another computer. I don't know what. Ah, okay, um, so we'll go with Joe Wilson, and then we'll go on to you, Joe Bakhti. So I guess we've settled the Joe issue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, hey, everyone. I'm Joe Wilson, Managing Director at Undeterred Capital. Um, by background, I'm a, a bioscience investor. Uh, I'm also a founder of a nonprofit called the C19 Coalition uh, that aims to create a unified supply chain uh, for help getting PPE to frontline workers. Um, over the last seven months, I've um, you know, been deeply involved in a lot of the COVID-19 response efforts uh, from late February all the way through the pr present day. And other Joe. Perfect, sorry, I'm a little late here. Um, yeah, yeah, just a few words about you, uh, you know, who you are and what you do, and then we'll dive right in. Sure. I'm the CEO of Quanchin. We are a Santa Monica-based biotechnology firm, and uh, we have some uh, another department in Germany, in Berlin, and starting also one in Ukraine for software development. But our heritage is in cancer detection and liquid biopsy, complex genomics, uh, but also merging the cloud and artificial intelligence with deep diagnostics. And yeah, over the last uh, six months, we have developed, we have deployed that capability into the COVID space and are now um, yeah, the only provider that can do COVID RT-PCR testing at scale at very fast turnaround times. That's kind of our niche. So we, we achieve same day uh, turnaround times very reliably um, at scale. Uh, mostly through a new system that we deploy where we integrate the entire workflow. Um, and we do this mostly, I mean, the market for that is mostly employers and movies, um, not so much government. Um, government has more time. So, you know, it's, uh, there, it's not it's so bad if you have 72 hours or 36 hour turnaround. Um, but that's what we specialize on. We are strong here in LA, uh, but now doing it nationwide starting in uh, November, mostly New York, Chicago, Florida, Atlanta, and so on. And it has been a tremendous journey to really help the community with COVID and um, also really innovating how we do real-time PCR testing at scale in a highly automated way. Thank you so much, um, Joe. So let, let's dive right in. There's often a tension between speed and accuracy when you talk about testing. And, and getting um, accurate results that have credibility. Can you guys talk about um, the technology that you've been looking at and um, how its use of AI or, or, and or data um, has, has helped alleviate that tension and improve those measures? Um, anyone feel free to jump in first. I mean, it's a little bit our, our, our key thing, so maybe I just jump in. Uh, sure. And I think you are absolutely right that there's a lot of discussion and innovation going on. How can we 
heat this up and have real time like immediate on site results. We are actually extremely skeptical about that because we have a pretty good understanding of the chemistry and there's no such thing as magic. So the idea that you can innovate 50 year old chemistry uh, and suddenly magically make it super precise without laboratory processes, I'm very skeptical about that, especially because you need very low false positives. False positives are terrible. Yeah. And so you need to get as close to 100% specificity as possible. And the difference between having 99 and 100 is pretty significant if you run 100,000 tests because you're, you're going to tell a thousand people they have COVID who don't have it. So that's non-trivial. So that's why we really focused on absolutely not compromising on precision, meaning we are sticking to gold standard RT-PCR processes and are not changing these processes. What we found is how we reduce turnaround times from peak capacity from basically seven days to four hours. It's all in the data flow. It's not the actual PCR process. It's about what, how do you accession samples? How do you register patients? How do you make sure it's all correct? And how do you automatically report results um, where we use a lot of AI and automated readouts from PCR machines that basically cut out the human component to a very large extent. And that is really, that's why we, we could centralize or compress the entire problem into the actual PCR run, which is only, you know, 60 minutes. And everything around is completely automated. So our strategy was don't touch the chemistry, stick with the gold standard, but then completely automate everything around it. And the higher your throughput is and the higher the scale is, the exponentially faster the whole thing becomes compared or benchmarked against the alternative. Um, Eliezer, you, uh, you and your colleagues recently received emergency use authorization from the FDA for a new technique known as SwabSeq. Could you, could you talk a little bit about how that, um, you know, if it does touch on this issue of speed versus accuracy or speed and accuracy? Yeah, so thank you so much for um, the opportunity to talk about it. So we had some really exciting news last week is that we got uh, FDA EUA authorization on a really fundamentally new technology that's applied to testing. So the, the story behind this project is that when our labs all got shut down, everyone, you know, no one could really work at UCLA. And I reached out to a couple of colleagues of mine and we started to thinking about how, you know, this COVID is a uh, RNA virus. And we have all these genomic sequencers in our labs that can, you know, that have in the last 20 years now can sequence someone's genome, you know, for less than less than a thousand dollars. And so what, the technology that we developed, you know, over these months is called SwabSeq. And the key idea behind it is that you, t you take everyone's sample as it comes in. We add a molecular barcode, which is pretty easy to do. A kind of a, you can imagine that this is a unique sticker that we add to every sample. And then we put all of them together in a sequencer. The sequencers are so powerful that a sequencer can, the sequencer that we're using in, in the lab that we set up at UCLA can do tens of thousands of samples in the same run. And so the technology, it's a kind of a different technology. It, it does things, it, just, it, it captures the same information as the PCR based test because it's measuring basically the same way. But because it uses a sequencer, it's highly scalable. A lab of just 10 people can process tens of thousands of samples in, a, in, in one day. So our, it's not a point of care test. And I agree with Joe, the same reasons why point of care tests that are gonna be highly accurate are probably unlikely. But we're hoping that, you know, if we have success with our deployment of SwabSeq at UCLA, other sites will, you know, deploy it or maybe existing testing sites will replace it as their back end. And we can get really cheap testing available uh, everywhere. Where our our target is to reach about ten dollars a test for PCR test, which we think is you know m much lower than what the cost of the reagents are you know for typical for typical technology. When when would you guys be rolling that out, Eliezer? Just given so, that you just got uh, the EUA. I mean, our plan is is to, uh, UCLA is doing. Uh, a surveillance testing of their students now. And our plan is within a few weeks to take that over and run it. And so 
and just to see, you know, how and scale it from there. And so we, our lab is right now fully operational. We're going to be in, in a few, you know, once we start doing that, then we'll kind of work out the, the, uh, you know, the details and, and test the technology a little bit more. And hopefully, you know, in the new year, we'll be able to be providing like lots of testing capacity for, you know, for outside partners. Eliza, can you maybe, can I jump in with a question? Please, yes, please. So can you just quickly explain um, if you want to like what, how exactly that works? Because I think it's a very smart idea. I just read about something like that, that didn't make sense that because the entire viral, uh, you know, RNA, which is not the purpose. So are you yeah. focusing just on a few segments or what? What's yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is that you, uh, you know, we have a, we're focusing on a few amplicons, a few probes, the same ones in the CDC panel, and we what we do is we first add a molecular backcode to every sample. So we have, we have uh, you know, in a in 384 well plate, we add a molecular backcode to every sample, and then that's unique to uh, every. Know. Yeah. So it's something with the sound, yeah. And so then, uh, and then when we sequence all the data. When we sequence all the samples, we can look to see which reads match the coronavirus, and then we can look to see among those reads what are the, what is the barcode on those reads and match that to the original patient. And that's how we can figure out who out of our mixture of tens of thousands of individuals we put in the sequencer actually has the virus. So you're looking at you're doing an extraction first, and then you're looking at yeah, so, the so so our, our protocol is extraction free. So we're doing either saliva or just swabs in media where we just uh, uh, process the media that the swab was sitting in. And you're focusing on one or two area, uh, two or three. Um, yeah, actually, actually, just, actually just now one amplicon, but we're considering adding additional ones for more accuracy. You really have one, you have one primer in there. One primer. Yeah. The, the thing is it's a digital readout because we're the data that comes from a sequencer is digital. So in, in a lot of ways, um, the basic technology is more accurate than standard PCR. Um, if we were looking at, you know, so because of that, we can move from a uh, purified or extracted RNA to unextracted RNA. And then we can, also go from, you know, to saliva, which is less accurate in general, but because our base technology is more accurate, we get kind of something that that's workable for surveillance. And, and Joe, um, I'm just going to jump in. I, 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 we hope at Dot LA to be uh, covering, um, you know, the advancements that um, uh, Dr. Eskin's making around this. And we've we've learned a little bit about it from last week, and we hope to continue covering. Um, but uh, I want to jump over to Yen um, because I know that you've been doing some efforts around contact tracing for USC. Can you talk a little bit um, about, you know, efforts to do that speedily and to do that accurately and what that's going to be looking like and how you guys are using data? Sure. Uh, so uh, at USC here, we have a research team uh, that um, uh, we work together with Professor Sarah Shahabi. Uh, basically, that um, Professor uh, Sarah Shahabi was building this particular uh, app that will be able to actually help um, uh, get the activity uh, of different type of um, uh, people on campus, such as students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and then given this particular activity information in terms of where they have been going on different day, uh, at the same time, given the knowledge of some tests of, for example, some students or some faculty get um, affected by COVID-19, uh, we're trying to use the AI technology uh, to actually predict uh, basically the propensity score for each individual person based on their activities per day. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, we will build uh, this particular uh, model that uh, uh, using Hox process, which is a, a statistical machine learning model to model the uh, traces between different uh, people or different users. Uh, then we'll be able to generate a probability distribution in terms of how likely uh, each individual person uh, will be contracted uh, with COVID-19, given the knowledge that uh, maybe some of the people on campus get infected. Uh, 
so right now that we're still under the development around the methodology, we got some preliminary results. Uh, I won't be able to show here with the visualization, but basically one thing that we uh, did is that we conduct uh, similar experiments on the Los Angeles uh, city based on the uh, activities of um, uh, LA uh, populations uh, from the, this is the data from December last year. Uh, we were able to actually predict uh, the propensity score for the LA population. And initially we can see that uh, basically people in the city area will have a higher chances of getting infected uh, because of you know uh, the spread of the disease of the patents. And gradually we can see that started to populate it through the rest of the uh, other countries. So basically that uh, it will be a very interesting uh, statistical model that will be able to provide uh, a lot of the support. And given the knowledge that you mentioned that the test may not be accurate, uh, in the model we'll be able to actually quantify accurately about the confidence uh, of the prediction given the knowledge of the test is not 100% accurate. So that we not only gave the propensity score, but also uh, a confidence interval so that we can uh, select the, uh, the correct population to do uh, the surveillance test as well. So uh, that's basically our uh, current work and there's a lot of ongoing work. Hopefully we'll be uh, able to uh, get more of you, uh, to more of you in the future. Is that is it done that? Are you guys doing it that way in order to protect privacy? Obviously, in terms of uh, individual privacy and people submitting details about their COVID results. Yeah, this is definitely uh, privacy is something that we are very much uh, wants to care uh, to build into the AI model because uh, we now got access to two different types of uh, very private information about uh, the users. One is about uh, their choices in terms of where they go uh, at different locations on campus. And the second one is obviously the test score. And both of them are uh, private information that we uh, would want the model to actually preserve. And that's why that when we design the model, uh, we have a particular privacy perspective so that we can utilize the privacy, um, uh, uh, statistical, uh, sorry, privacy th theoretical guarantees that is the, uh, uh, the privacy uh, differential equations to study our analysis results so that we'll be able to uh, predict the propensity score for each individual user without revealing the privacy information about others. Oh, wow. So like my individual score is like an 80%. That's like depending on how risky I am in my behaviors. Yes. So this depends on obviously where uh, that individual user will go on each particular day and obviously uh, there will be some other uh, uh, information regarding other users uh, where they went. Obviously, the uh, intuition is that if some person goes to a place that frequently visited by other users, uh, then they will have a higher chance. But it's not necessarily fully determined by that because if it happens that there no one actually visited that area has been exposed to COVID-19, then we're safe. That is why we this will demand a sophisticated statistical model and AI models to uh, make the effective inference while preserving the privacy. So perhaps one day people will go to Google and they'll look up a location and they'll also get a privacy or uh, a risk score for that location. Is that the idea? Yes, and this is not only for uh, retrospect for contact tracing, but also for prevention. In the future, people can uh, determine obviously by themselves whether they want to go to make that visit or not. Um, so uh, why don't we switch gears to Joe Wilson. Um, you've been in the funding space, um, you were with Mars Bio, um, and you've had your fingers in many different areas uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey that you've been on? Um, you were involved with Curative Inc., which has been doing a lot of uh, LA County's testing. Um, you know, what have you seen in terms of how that's played out? Um, maybe what was expected or unexpected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's really interesting when I hear everyone here on the panel describe just the unbelievable work they're doing. Uh, I, I can't help but think of, of unfortunately, what was what was lost over these last seven months. And for me, you know, I think we spent on a and I'm speaking on a national level. On a national level, we spent so much time 
uh, just aggregating data, just trying to get an accurate count of how many cases are out there, what does hospitalization data look like, how do those hospitalizations actually equate to, to deaths from COVID-19, that unfortunately we couldn't do a lot of the more interesting stuff in terms of digging into populations to see how COVID was exploding in their areas uh, in real time or anything close to real time. And I think, unfortunately, that, that was one of the key early missteps, that it wasn't until really the last month or two where the data was accessible and aggregated enough where some of this, um, some of this more in-depth analysis could even be done. So I, unfortunately, I think that that was a, um, it, it's funny when we talk about AI or advanced machine learning, I, I think oftentimes we forget about just the foundational building blocks to make sure that the data is accurate, that it's, that it's sent in a timely manner. And especially when you're dealing with an evolving situation like COVID-19, it, it just really underscores the overall importance. And so what I saw play out in March and April, I mean, I think all everyone in, on this call was a part of it or, or saw some, some aspect of it, but I think it evolved differently in the testing space and, um, and in the PPE space and in the vaccine space. So in the, uh, in the diagnostic space, um, in the testing space, you know, what's, what's really interesting is that often for diagnostic companies, there's, there's kind of multiple life cycles for these companies. Early on, ability to handle scientific complexity and ability to make scientific progress really defines a company's life for the first two, three or four years. What we saw in the spring was that time cycle get just highly compressed and move into the second part of the company's life cycle, which is approval, which in, this, in some cases was weeks. Um, and then the third phase is often operational complexity. How quickly can you scale up and reach your end customers? And what was really interesting about the spring is that companies that were exceptional in the third bucket in handling operational complexity have really been the ones that have broken away from the pack in a substantial way. And, and obviously Curative is one of those examples, um, but, but there are, are several others too. Um, if you think about the complexity that is required to process tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of samples a day um, across multiple states, um, as you have a supply chain that's totally in flux, it's a really major challenge. And so that's been a, a really interesting learning as I've seen companies in the testing space is that has been a major, major differentiator. In the, in the PPE space, that's been a totally different world. Um, in, in March, what we saw was a total collapse of the PPE supply chain. And it's, you know, I think if you look at the, the headlines, it's, oh, we're out of masks and we're out of gloves uh, and we're out of plenty of other materials. But the further you chase this, uh, the, the further back in the supply chain you go, you realize it's, it's not really about the masks. It's about the production capability to make the masks and to make the other materials. And then you say, okay, well, What's the problem with the capacity? And the problem with the capacity is there's literally not enough machines that make the input material to create these masks. And when you say, okay, who make these machines? You come across these, uh, these German companies like Raffenhauser, which are hundreds of years old, that have a pretty fixed supply of how many machines they make on an annual basis. And if all of a sudden that demand goes up by 500%, it takes a while to catch up to that. And so that, that flux in supply chain really define the PPE game for the first two or three months. And now what we're seeing is uh, there's still a very high level of demand, but it's been met by an almost equal surge in supply. So you have specific stockouts of some items um, while others have, have reached a little bit closer to equilibrium. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, I, I wanna go back to Yen because um, you've been hard at work on multiple facets of the COVID pandemic, and you created an AI tech bot named Jennifer, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it or or her, um, and and also, um, you know, what other uh, areas you have in the works specifically around cleaning up misinformation um, online around the pandemic. 
Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so first of all, the chatbot, uh, Jennifer AI is not by my team only, it's actually a group effort. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so basically that we now know that uh, there are a lot of misinformation uh, currently on around COVID-19 ever starting from February or March timeframe. So uh, in my research group, uh, we uh, started collecting the data uh, from Twitter starting in uh, March until now for all the tweets around COVID-19. And then we conducted the analysis uh, on uh, predicting and identifying the misinformation around COVID-19. And also most importantly, we try to understand who are the people behind them and trying to understand that what is their uh, mechanism and uh, motivation behind this. Uh, so uh, without too much going to the details, but a summary is basically trying to say there are a lot of different type of bad actors on our, uh, the social media platform. And also they have different purposes. Some of them are political bait. Uh, that is literally just trying to get more uh, advertisement so that you can get more money. Some of them are more uh, uh, political oriented so that they will be actually associated COVID-19 with some specific political opinions or, uh, or um, different type of uh, um, uh, political figures. Or some of them were actually uh, uh, just trying to disturb uh, the whole society, uh, where they just try to confuse the people in terms of uh, the relationship between COVID-19 and also the flu, uh, or that where uh, the uh, COVID-19 is originated. Uh, so our project uh, was uh, providing a lot of the uh, important information about all the misinformation. Once we identify the information, basically we need to take actions. And that is where uh, the chatbot uh, Jennifer uh, 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 comes in. So this is a joint effort uh, with uh, the new voices of academies of engineering, science and medicine, where a group of 20 uh, researchers uh, in different areas. And once the COVID-19 uh, outbreaks in the US, and across the globe. Uh, we think that just really our efforts trying to address and trying to play some role in there. And misinformation is one of the key tasks that we identified. Once our group has identified all the different type of misinformation from COVID-19, and then the Jennifer bot, uh, the, the chatbot Jennifer uh, will use this type of input, uh, trying to broadcast the, the fact around COVID-19. For example, they will uh, disseminate information that is COVID-19 it's not the same death rate as flu uh, and also advertise uh, and trying to educate the general public uh, about some important facts about COVID-19. So uh, this is really, uh, I think, uh, um, important information and important uh, issue that we need to address as a whole society. Probably many of you have watched recently the Netflix uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma. Uh, basically that right now there's such a huge uh, pandemic, not only in our society in terms of physically for COVID-19, but also a pandemic of misinformation and polarized uh, uh, thoughts around um, uh, COVID-19 specifically or uh, uh, the publicly in general or different type of things. So we think this is something really important we need to address and that's why that we build a dashboard around COVID-19 and that's all why we uh, actually contribute uh, to help build the chatbot, Janet. Thank you, Yen. Um, just a quick question, because I understand your team was building algorithms to try and identify misinformation around COVID-19 and also perhaps around the election. Um, but, you know, to allude, you know, broadly to the elephant in the room or, you know, on the airwaves, how has it been difficult to, how, how has it been a Effective and has it been difficult to parse political rhetoric um, via algorithm, given that you know individuals uh, from you know random bots, automated bots, foreign actors to the president of the United States might be putting information out there that is being flagged as misinformation. Yeah, this is such a wonderful uh, question to ask, and then obviously there's a lot of controversials out there. Uh, so I think that basically uh, the AI model look at very different perspective. Obviously, from the human perspective, when we look at the text, we read the context, we will form opinion whether this is going to be a misinformation or not. 
But on the other hand, that for the AI model, they're not only looking at the specific text, which would be very difficult to make judgment. We also actually looking at all the traces of individual users. Um, that means that uh, we will use the AI model to examine the large amount of data available in terms of what, what each individual Twitter user are actually tweeting, what is their tweeting behaviors, uh, and, and then uh, based on the different type of patterns and, and the knowledge, uh, sorry, the information was propagated throughout the internet, we have be uh, built different type of AI models to uh, detect bad actors, not only through the text only, but also through uh, all the different activity patterns as well. Uh, it's definitely a long uh, shot in terms of research perspective, but I think that uh, based on our re research results so far, we were able to identify a series of orchestrated campaigns to propagate misinformation around COVID-19. And they also utilize very different strategies to propagate this type of information. Uh, we hope that this will help us to identify more of them and obviously attract uh, and also address uh, other issues beyond COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Eliezer, I'd love to um, go back to you and, and have you talk a little bit about other efforts you, you guys have underway um, around uh, the, uh, the somewhat the, the newly formed computational um, medicine uh, uh, department is that right? Yeah, thank thank you. You know, it's it's just also hearing Yan, who I've, I've known for many years, talk, and and from the two Joes, it's really interesting because you know none of us worked on viruses or testing <laughs> or you know misinformation or anything like that before. So it's kind of what's interesting about uh, COVID is that you know the whole world started working on this and trying to develop new technologies. And I think when people really think about what's going to really make an impact, people don't think about, people really think about scaling existing types of methods, but they don't think about new advances and new innovations. If you look at vaccines, for example, there's a huge array of, you know, completely novel approaches that are developed to vaccines. Um, so, so in my department, our goal is really technology development. And so we've done a of several things, and I'm now speaking for the work of many people. Um, one project that we were very, uh, we were working very closely with the hospital was, especially in early kind of April, to understand uh, what was going to happen. Uh, because on the news, right, we were seeing that there was a, a hospital in Central Park, right, and nobody had any idea of whether or not that would happen in other cities. And we actually got involved and in, we were actually already working with the hospital with the, um, at health records of individuals in the emergency room and trying to understand when people were coming there for avoidable reasons, we can route that to other care. And so that project, like every other project, moved over to COVID and we started looking, understanding uh, how many people are going to come in and how many are going to need ventilators. And this is something that we actually deployed and they were able to use it in a kind of non-intuitive way. So I think when people think about COVID and the kind of surge in the health system, they really think about, you know, are, is the health system going to be overloaded? But there's actually another major aspect, which is underutilization of the health system. So in April and May, there were uh, all the hospitals in California were closed for elective procedures. So there's, you know, just in UCLA, thousands of you know, procedures that didn't happen. Um, there's many people that got mammograms that were supposed to get mammograms that didn't get them. There are many people that, you know, just na nation nationally would have been diagnosed with cancer but didn't come to the, didn't have their point of cancer. So, understanding exactly how much how many resources the hospital needs to set aside for COVID so they can fill the rest of their hospital with with other care turned out to be very important. And so we you know, share these tools. But through the network of, of, you know, kind of the operations groups of the hospital. So other places have also used them as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, and I, I wanted to just pop over to you, Joe Wilson, because you have talked a little bit about seeing, um, you know, uh, companies and, uh, and uh, workers uh, sort of um, 
latch on might not be the best word, but but dive in on COVID as sort of a way to uh, utilize what they're working on and make it incredibly relevant to the public. Can you talk about a little bit about what you've seen, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think what I love about uh, Eliezer's point, which is one, yes, a year ago, a discussion of COVID-19, all of us would shrug our shoulders and kind of go on with our days. But I think what that illustrates is, you know, especially early in the crisis, the amount of impact that an individual could have in affecting others' lives. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen another time, at least in my lifetime, where that existed. I mean, one great example is there's a, a woman named Marie Rippon of uh, the CEO of Lab Launch, who I, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know. Um, and Marie basically single-handedly got a thousand gallons of hand sanitizer to the city of LA, which were then dispersed to nursing homes across LA. Which is just like, I mean, if you think now, you know, we've got hand, san hand sanitizer all over the place, but back in March, you know, it was extremely tough to come by. And so like the amount of lives that like an individual like Marie saved during a period is just like, you know, people dream for moments like that. And so I think it is like really encouraging to see, you know, first it was just any, any individuals and anyone who put up their hand to help and had an impact. How we saw that evolve was over time, we started to see entrepreneurs enter the mix. And many of them came from either A, they were starting companies, B, they were pivoting their companies, or C, they were saying, hey, like we're not gonna pivot, but we're gonna help out however we can. And so in, in March and April, a lot of the solutions that I was seeing um, were, were spot solutions, which is fair because that's where the problems are. And what I mean by spot solutions was people said, hey, we're out of masks, let's build a mask factory. We're out of gloves, let's build a glove factory. Let's get more gloves here, right? Which is which is good for a point in time, but if you're looking at them as a venture investor, like it, it's unlikely that you're going to invest in most of those businesses. Where you're going to invest in is long-term growth potential and kind of, hey, can this be a generation defining company within the next 10 years? And since I would say early May, we've seen a, a huge influx of entrepreneurs in that space who are specifically working on solutions that take a, a wider view of the market that aren't just, hey, like let's build a mass factory, but how do we develop more efficient supply chains that are not just just in time, but provide more resilience over the long term? Um, hey, let's it's we're not just developing a diagnostic for COVID, but how can we use this influx of public funding to to fund additional diagnostic tools to get people to take diagnostics more than they otherwise would have um, to 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 push for uh, more regular procedures and, and checkups? Like what are the leverage points that we can double down on that have come at, come as a result of the crisis? Thank you, Joe Wilson. Um, Joe Bakhti, actually, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about, um, and, and really this is for anyone to weigh in on, um, but uh, how does uh, cost figure into your calculations? Um, obviously you guys are doing, uh, you know, trying to do technological advancements for the way we're dealing with testing. And, um, you know, uh, for COVID-19, you know, testing um, has, uh, in certain areas, it's been free depending on what test and where you go. Um, but, you know, it, it, the price of testing specifically around COVID-19 can vary. Um, so how does AI, the use of AI and the use of technology impact costs, generally speaking, but then also specifically to the, around the work that you're doing. And um, Joe Bach, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think that's great. Let me do a little excursion and then I come exactly to that question. No, I think yes. What the other Joe said is so interesting because we are constantly, in the beginning, our heritage is very, very different because we come from cancer detection, cell-free DNA sequencing, uh, and over the last five years, we poured like $13 million and a lot of brains and hearts and stress into the question, how can we build the world's most sensitive sequencing technology to detect multiple cancers early stage in the blood? So if you sell uh, everyone in the company and your investors on that vision, and then suddenly a virus hits and you're like, oops, now we do RNA, RNA PCR, you have a lot of explanation to do and you have to figure out, okay, how does this all work out, right? Who are we? What is our vision? And, you know, cancer is a very big problem that kills many more people than COVID every single year and it's not going away. So, you know, when we saw this whole thing, we, we just, initially we were standing by and said, well, we are not virologists and we know how this works, but, you know, other people might solve it. But what we saw what COVID did to quantine is it, 
it kind of, you know, all these opportunities in front of us made us very aware of a completely different part of our core business that we completely ignored. And also to Joe's point, it's interesting to have someone who thinks strategically about these things. The phases of startups they go through, we were completely in the in phase one, like heads down doing crazy science, super qualitative, um, never talking about costs or scale or speed. It was all about how do we solve the core medical problem. Now, COVID is, we did the opposite. We started on that scale speed turnaround time and that expose us to all these laboratory processes which are ancient they're like dinosaur processes people with pencils you know, writing down little numbers on tubes and so we leapfrog that and now have probably the most you know the fastest most streamlined intake process in the world and what that did to our core business and it includes also some ai components we developed for COVID, but that are very different from the cancer detection ai and what that did to us, why this is so important for the company, for the core business, we now understand that, you know, once we launch liquid biopsy cancer detection and whole exome sequencing that is automated, you know, clinical results that we develop, the, the question how fast we can deploy that at what cost and how we optimize these processes and how we tie in third party labs and scale this across the, the nation and other countries is now top of mind because that's exactly what we do in COVID. And so there is a huge technology synergy because these blind spots we had as early stage biotech entrepreneurs, I think we, we see now much more what the big picture of a scalable you know, business is you can take public in a very different space in deep sequencing and, and liquid biopsy. And maybe one last thing before I quickly talk about costs, another totally different side effect is that the key accounts we are acquiring, we're very focused on employers uh, and, and self payers right now, is also total gold on a customer acquisition level, right? Suddenly we talk to, you know, the heads of Disney and Comcast and Citigroup and all these people. Um, we could never had access them and now they're getting full exposure to our cloud system, to all our other products. And, you know, they're very interested, they want to have a COVID solution, but it's these synergies are, uh, just enormous for us. And so finally to the price question, you know, it, it made us much more sensitive to price and costs at the related thing. How do you bring down costs? And um, what what we realized is there is in laboratory processes, there's a lot of um, cost cutting potential uh, in terms of turnaround times and efficiencies. And in the end price, you know, in a competitive market, it's just a little premium on your cost structure. And so it's all about the cost structure. How do you get that down? And um, we see that technology, including AI, because our automated readout, for example, on the PCR side is very AI driven, um, has a very direct impact on our cost structure. And we try to pass it on to customers. So we are now at a, I can't tell you the exact pricing, but something that is significantly below the insurance reimbursement for our enterprise clients. Um, and I think that is, you know, that would, have been very hard to imagine four months ago. So, you know, we try to make it as cheap as possible at scale, um, and it's all a function of the cost basis. And AI and cloud, it's these two things in combination, have a very hard and direct impact uh, on that on that cost basis. Um, I would love for um, Eliezer for you to jump in a little bit on that. Um, obviously, you guys are are trying to bring it down to about ten dollars. Um, has that been the the goal all along? Um, why that number? Uh, what is that? What does that sort of mean? So yeah, I mean, look, I think here's the thing: is that we believe that if testing, accurate testing, is so cheap that it's ten dollars, right? And so like, there's literally millions and millions of tests available every day. Then Life Summit 2021 will be in person, right? So that's really the goal. So you know, we're, we're a nonprofit, right? UCLA, we're, our goals, you know, we have a, a research and education and service mission. And so these kinds of activities really work in our, in our sense. We're not just, um, you know, we're not deploying, I mean, we are deploying, uh, we have a lab, we're gonna test, you know, uh, UCLA and, you know, as many people as we can in Los Angeles, but really the impact will be is if other groups say, hey, look at what they're doing. They're at you know, fraction of the cost and how is like only 10 people doing this many tests? 
we hope that other people will just replicate and build their own swab seek labs and really scale this to you know to so we can just have like limitless amounts of tests and so it's about ten dollars because it's maybe about five dollars for all the consumables and then when you're doing you know the and all the sequencing reagents and everything but then when you're doing um you know so many using technologies like joe's like like just really kind of optimized workflows you can then really bring down you know the margin that you need for all the logistical components could be brought down to something smaller obviously you can't have pen and paper you need to do the kinds of things that he's talking about uh, but that's the goal because we really believe that you know if we have low because you know if it's really expensive people can't afford it right so you can't afford to test every kid going to school at you know fifty dollars a, a, a test twice a week that's impossible right we don't have that instead we just wait for the vaccine to come that's what we're doing so that that's kind of where we uh, that's really the goal the goal is to bring it down as as, as inexpensive as possible um yeah do you want to weigh in on that uh, in terms of uh the contact tracing are you guys uh involved is there any cost involved with the work that you're doing right now or moving forward yeah i think one of the reason why we want to do contact tracing is actually eliminate the unnecessary tests right if we are go only going to test the people who have a higher risk uh, under some particular threshold in order to do effective tests, reducing the cost, and obviously reducing that everyone an unnecessary inconvenience to be tested every day. So I think from that perspective, it's really another way to think about uh, the, uh, the cost perspective. We don't uh, work directly with the USC uh, uh, regarding the test, uh, regarding the civilian test yet, but that is one of the reasons why we work on this so that we can provide the propensity score uh, so that we can reduce the amount of surveillance test but at the same time that getting the similar uh, results out there. I, I, I mean, this can be obviously generalizable to uh, the whole cities or even the whole countries. Uh, but at the same time that, uh, I think that reducing the cost of the test itself is extremely important. Uh, but even if this is just one cent, you can't afford to test everybody every day. In the end, there has to be some way to reduce the, the numbers of tests and also uh, the populations that we need to test. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, I, I suspect you might have some uh, thoughts around this uh, this area of uh, tension between, um, you know, cost and and technology and and how technology impacts cost, especially because dealing with entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, uh, they're not they're not always uh, nonprofit workers. So, yeah, it's honestly been one of the biggest challenges when when assessing companies because um, you have like in the market overall right now, you obviously have significant cost pressure. And and like from a from a human point of view, you want those costs as low as possible, right? Like you want widespread testing that's as cheap as possible so that most people can get it as as, as possible. Um, but that creates complications if you're talking about a business model, right? Um, if you started in February or March selling tests for 150 or $200 a pop, not because you were greedy, but because that's just what things cost, um, and you've built a business model around that, then you need to think carefully about what the next six months are gonna bring with this added cost pre pressure, uh, and what the next 12 months are gonna bring. And so one thing that, I mean, in, any company that I talk to, you know, one of the key questions is, is how do you bridge? How do you go from the current pandemic world to the post-pandemic world? Um, or even not a post-pandemic world, but a new phase of the pandemic. And, you know, entrepreneurs aren't dumb. Uh, entrepreneurs are, I mean, are, are the smartest people on the planet. So they they stay awake thinking about answers to these questions. But, but I think what a lot of people miss, and especially a lot of investors miss, is, is this transitionary period after the testing costs go down, you know, is not that unusual compared to the normal startup life cycle. If you have a you have a venture back company, if you have a high growth company, at a certain point, your initial market is going to be saturated and you're going to have to make a jump to a larger market, to a more dynamic market, to introduce new products. It's just that for, for a lot of the, the testing companies today, they have to basically deal with those problems in their first year or two of existence as opposed to in year five or six. 
And so I, I think because of that, there's there are a tremendous number of opportunities for the testing companies. And it, I don't think the, the cost will end up being a disqualifier for the ones that are really well positioned and the ones who have been thoughtful about strategy. Thanks, Joe. Um, at some point, COVID-19, we all hope, will pass. Um, and when it does, uh, what do you all feel like are some of the longer term trends of this eight month will sort of bring into the future uh, whether around uh, the fast tracking of, of authorizations for, for testing and techniques or the creation of vaccines. Um, and uh, why don't we start with uh, the other Joe, Joe Bakhti. Well, I think there's a saying that a crisis accelerates innovation. You know, every time of crisis is a, crisis of is a time of innovation. And Curative is one of the great examples. I mean, these guys basically started in January. They were a tiny little startup no one knew about, except for by Combinator and Andreessen, of course. And they, you know, they didn't have much, and then they pivoted, and now they are on track of beating LabCorp and Quest in terms of COVID uh, test process. Like, if you think about what that means, and think about how Quest and LabCorp really missed the train and messed it completely up, um, I think what we see is, a sustainable transformation of the diagnostic space. I think the introduction of cloud systems, AI, but also very savvy entrepreneurs who think like tech founders in a very you know dinosaur dominated space. You had always these smart scientists at the top of the funnel, but then not so smart companies at the end of the funnel in diagnostics. Uh, so you know, among investors and people who know the industry, diagnostics doesn't have a very good reputation. You normally stay away from it because it's boring and bad for business, the science is interesting. And I think that has very much changed. We see some new players who are totally transforming this. And COVID gives us this boost, right? All these smaller startups like Quanti and Curative and some others, and Brio Labs, for example, also cool. Um, so I think it just turbo boosts all these guys, these tech minded entrepreneurs who wanted to get into precision medicine and the centerpiece of precision medicine is molecular diagnostics and they had this problem that investors didn't like molecular diagnostics as a business and i think COVID gave us all a turbo boost to really get momentum really re-establish the paradigms around diagnostics and i think that will actually define the next 10 years uh, so i think it's super important because it's a key component of precision medicine that was super discounted and everyone hated it. Uh, and I think it is the core component. And now, you know, we have a whole new range of players in that space, which is very good. Thank you so much, Joe, for that thoughtful response. Um, Jan, do you have any thoughts around what comes, what does the future look like? How do these trends impact uh, future efforts? Sure. I think that uh, I would say from two perspectives, I think from the medical health perspective, uh, this is a really uh, uh, opportunity for all of us to step into uh, to developing all these fast tests, the emergency response, and uh, and the pandemic in general. That means that we're going to be uh, be much more ready for the next pandemic, even though this particular pandemic has not been fully uh, uh, addressed yet. Uh, but I think from the societal perspective, uh, there will be fundamental changes in terms of uh, uh, people's behavior towards work, towards life. Um, and uh, I think there are a huge number of business are going to uh, become a, a, a really uh, a huge uh, uh, in the next decade to come because of COVID-19. For example, uh, Zoom and a lot of the conferences decided to go remotely rather than people have to pay for the uh, huge expenses to attend these meetings. Uh, and then obviously that um, a lot of these uh, uh, creative education component that we do not necessarily need the, the children to go in person. Now a lot of these activities can be conducted through online and also online shopping uh, in terms of the delivery and the, the demand and how we actually do the supply and chain management. The whole, that whole thing is also going to be revolutionized. 
Uh, and obviously, that when we talk about social media, we realize there's a huge issue in terms of the current social media platforms. There will there's going to be a, a big reform in terms of what will be the next generation social media platform, how it will look like, how this will change humans' behaviors. Uh, I think it's going to be changing drastically, uh, and some of them will be uh, uh, for the good reason. Thank you, Yen. Uh, Eliezer, do you have thoughts around this? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, first of all, you know, I mean, I can just give perspective. I think next week we're getting a million funnels for saliva tests, right, coming in. Like that never would have happened, you know, in a million years to us. But I think more fun, fun something that we didn't really talk about, the fundamental change is that all the health systems have completely changed. I mean, just the shock of supporting telemedicine on an unprecedented scale. And the other thing is that access to data of, you know, uh, EHR data to researchers ar around COVID, looking at patient records in real time to support care is something that I feel like was like 10 years of advances and kind of access and just kind of dropping, you know, um, like bureaucratic hurdles because literally lives were on the line that we progressed, I feel like 10 years in um, April and May. And so I think that'll have really fundamental, um, you know, opportunities for entrepreneurs and researchers to look at, you know, precision medicine, access to care, you know, like remote monitoring, mobile health, that'll be real tremendous. And, you know, I know known Jan for, for many years, we never worked on anything like this before that has very public facing and kind of public engagement. I mean, academia, you know, we we publish our papers, we try to deploy our technologies, but COVID is a completely different thing. We're really just trying to push our technologies out into the marketplace. And that's not something that was happening before. So I think both of those things will really, I think, open up kind of a links between investments and uh, universities and t entrepreneurs. I think it really just makes, you know, even though ironically, we're all isolated in our homes, but I feel like these, you know, investment entrepreneurs and uh, science and technology are much more integrated because of COVID. Thank you so much, Eliezer. Uh, we're gonna let you, Joe Wilson, have the last word here. We're running a bit short on time, so, um, but we'd, I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like before COVID hit, there was a lot of discussion about how technology had stagnated overall and that we needed something equivalent to the, the space race uh, to really jumpstart technological innovation. And, and I think, you know, by, by accident, we, we kind of have stumbled upon that. We've accelerated all of these incredible trends over the last year. Uh, and though, you know, often it hasn't felt like we're united as a human race in doing that, I, I think there have been a lot of second and third order effects that could profoundly change the way that we do business, the way that we do medicine, the way that we study biology and implement it. I mean, like really easy things to think about, like, is EUA going to be the same after COVID? Is vaccine approval going to be the same after COVID? Like we we've by the end of this calendar year, we'll have gone from identification of a virus to through phase one, two, and three trials for a vaccine to approval of a vaccine to initial deployment of a vaccine in one calendar year. That's just, that's unbelievable. And so without anyone really looking for it, I think we are in the middle of a space race. And what's going to happen is in the 10 years that follow, we're going to be, we're going to see a lot of acceleration of these trends we're going to see a huge influx of scientists and entrepreneurs stepping up and making these advances. And I think as dark as this year has been, I think it's going to lead to an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable decade for all of us. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you all joining us for this panel. And um, thank you, everyone out there for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Todd, uh, for holding this. And, um, and that's it for us. <laughs>